Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, dedicated to informing residents about health care topics and issues. Through programs featuring community forums and free health and wellness classes, our goal is to empower community members with the information needed to make informed health decisions. Washington Hospital has been providing health care to the residents of the Washington Township Healthcare District for the past 60 years. Today's presenters are from Fremont Bank. Mark Spilner is Vice President of Corporate Security Fraud. John Gilmore is Director of Corporate Security and Fraud. Bob Valadon, Relationship Manager for Fremont Bank. And Mark Rhodes Owsley, Vice President and Chief Information Security Officer. I'll tell you, I'm a baby boomer. I, I'm getting old now, I'm almost there myself. But the reason we're here, this is the reason that we're here. This is the reason we love our parents. Our parents were the greatest things in the world. My parents were the greatest generation and that's where I come from. That's how I was raised and that's what I did. This is my dad. My dad was in the seminary. World War II broke out. He went off, joined the Marines and off he went to World War II. And that's exactly, when he came back, he went, his sister came back. My dad was actually on a ship underneath the Golden Gate Bridge when he said, hey, what should I do? Should I go back to the seminary? Should I get a job? What should I do? His older sister says, hey, why don't you come to a picnic? He went to a July 4th picnic and met this lovely woman, my mom, okay? He did not go back to the seminary, did he? He never made it back. This, he never lost his faith, but he never went back to the seminary. They ended up getting married. And like the rest of you, they bought a little house in Casta Valley, two bedroom, one bath. And the next thing you know, there was five of us, five kids that they had. So they decided, uh-oh, we better build on. They built on an extra bedroom, they built on an extra bath, and they built on a rumpus room. How, that's how old I am. We had rumpus rooms back then. But this greatest generation, guys, that's what I'm talking about. We're talking about the greatest generation. You guys have any clue on how many young men and women went off to World War II? Anybody? Not putting anybody on the spot, 16 million of you. 16 million went off to World War II, signed up and went for the war. How many are left? 496,000. There's one right there, 496,000. My dad would always say, they're dropping like flies. He would open up the obituary and say, yeah, they're dropping like flies. But that's why I'm here, because of my parents. This is Bob's dad. He was also in the seminary. You think he made, became a priest? Nah, he didn't become a priest either. He ended up meeting Bob's lovely mother, and they had got married, and off they went. One thing, and they had how many kids, Bob? Five? Five of you. We ended up having seven. Seven of us were in that little bedroom. Bob grew up in San Leandro, in a little house, and they had it. But this is Bob's family right here. As you can see, I think this guy here on the right... I think he was, did you think, you were Don Johnson? <laughs> Miami Vice? I mean, look at that guy. I think I'd be afraid of him of elder abuse. Guy wants, anybody wears that type of clothing, you just wonder about it. He has sunglasses, he's indoor, has sunglasses. I guess when you're cool, Val, the sun always shines, doesn't it? This is John's parents. John's dad went to the military himself during the Vietnam War. So we have all veterans, guys. We have veterans of the World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam, we have veterans out there, and we're all getting old now. They ended up having, this is John's parents now, and they're doing great. Mark Rhodes Owsley, unfortunately, he's a guest that came a little bit late. He's our special guest that we're having tonight, and I didn't get his parents in here. But Mark's smart. You know, he's always telling me how smart he is and everything, so we don't really need his picture in here. So we're going to talk about elder abuse. John, I want you to go ahead and explain in layman terms of what elder abuse is. Hi, everybody. So elder abuse when it comes to banks and how we try to protect you guys and where the law falls is anybody 65 and older, right, is considered an elder. If you're a 18 to 64 and you're a dependent adult, we also, anytime we suspect elder abuse, not prove but suspect, elder abuse, we are required by law to file that. We file with a company which is called APS, Adult Protective Services. And this, these people, these social workers that are with them are here to help you guys, help you, right? We're required to file that paperwork within 48 hours. And then APS 
is required to do an investigation within seven days and find out what's going on, call you, visit you, see what's happening to see if they sense there's any abuse involved. If there is, we would get law enforcement involved, right? But it's their job to go out and talk to you guys as well as us at a bank. Right, and today we are going to go over a bunch of stuff of how we try to protect you, how you guys are going to catch elder abuse and when you're trying to become, when you're a victim, right? And we want you guys to see all the red flags and how we can help you and other people out there that can help you guys. All right, thanks. So it is, again, mandatory. We're mandatory reporters. We have to report this. We don't have any choice on this. It's like when Bob and I were police officers. Bob was in Oakland. I was in Hayward, actually a real department. You know, Hayward Police instead of Oakland Police. It was a real department. I'll get the mic soon. <laughs> But it ended up you know, like, like uh, domestic violence. When I first started, they didn't have a domestic violence law. And now all of a sudden, they, after I retired, they came up with the domestic violence, requiring police officers to report that. And that's the same thing on this. There's a requirement that banks have to do it. Statistics-wise, we have to realize one in every 44 are elder abuse it's unbelievable how much and how much money are we talking look at the money we're talking about three not million three billion dollars to 36 billion dollars a year a year it's amazing how much money is lost during that time and that's what we have to we're out, we're out here to protect you on that that's why we don't want you guys to be the victim of an elder abuse statistic wise like I t talked earlier about the greatest generation what else does the greatest generation produce what do they produce kids a lot of us we're the baby boomers Mike Wallace back there is a baby boomer we're all baby boomers and we are the biggest generation in the history those, those young kids came back and they just started having babies right and left. I'm one of seven. Bob's one of five. My, my uh, aunts and uncles had, one of them had six, the other one had five. They were just popping out babies right and left. So how many baby boomers, now it's at 65, like John said, at 65, how many a day you think are becoming baby boomers right now? A day. 10,000. 10,000 of us every single day are become elder. We're coming 65 years and older. No, so that's what, it, it's amazing how much there are. And by 20,030, one out of every five will be old, will be elders. <laughs> and if John has any of my, any of my, if I make him a power of attorney or anything, I'm in big trouble because he's gonna take me for everything I got. Why are older, why are you guys the target? Why are older people the target? You guys got the money. You guys are the ones with the money. These millenniums, they don't have any money. We've saved. My mom and dad, literally, my mom, my dad died in the house. And my dad was 89 when he died. He died in his own house. He, was, he had nobody helping him. He had the six kids helping. I lost one brother at the age of four of leukemia. But he had all of us there. He died in his house. My mom, 93 years old, died in her house. She was all by herself, but we, the kids were there all the time. But then that's the thing that we have to watch, is that we had the money. They would call us. There were six kids, six spouses, 21 grandkids. They call us up. Hey, we're spending more of your inheritance. We go, where are we going? They took us on six cruises, Hawaii twice, Canada. They spent all their money, but yell, but still, at the same time, they go buy day-old bread at Safeway because they grew up through in that depression, and that's exactly what they did. But they're after up you guys because you have the money. Like I said, you guys have Social Security, you have pensions, you have, you have all this stuff coming up, and it's a lot more sophisticated now, too, in elder abuse and, and fraud. When I first started as bank, it was easy. Main thing was checks. We have check fraud. We have check fraud all the time. But it was easy. We had a paper trail to fall. Now, you got these criminals. These guys are tough. We don't even find them half the time. Half the time they're across the ocean and they're on computers looking for you guys to fish stuff like that. So that's what we're talking about. So again, it's because you guys have all of the, have all of the 
Trust, and you guys trust everybody. What happens is when you trust everybody, that's how we grew up. I grew up in a Catholic school. Those nuns said we trusted those nuns. We trusted everybody, as are most of you guys. Most of you guys grew up with trust. Now, these kids, you almost can't, you hate to say it, but it's hard to trust almost anybody anymore. So they're also looking to become victim because they're socially isolated. Again, my mom passed, my mom was by herself for the last three years, but she would call. She would get a, a crank call. She'd get a crank call. I walked in the house one day. She's talking to a crankster, I mean a fraudster, talking about what? She didn't care. She was having fun. I said, oh my God, I'm listening to my mom. She's having fun talking to this guy. Finally, when she hung up, I said, mom, you can't do that. She said, I'm just having fun. I got nothing else to do. I'm sitting home all day. So I mean, she had fun, but that's what they're looking for. Abuse, it takes a major toll on you guys. It's hard. You're, it's financial loss. It takes it out on you physically. Like the, like the film just said, you guys are going to, you know, they die sooner because of that. So you have to watch that and everything. So you have a lot, you have a shortened lifespan on you. You have financial hardship. You get depressed. You know, you're sitting at home. You really don't want to tell your kids because you're afraid the kids might put you in a home and everything. But you got to trust your kids. I know a lot of kids, uh, kids abuse you guys. Unfortunately, some of them do. But that's what we're going to talk about a lot on who to trust, who not to trust. And it's a tough one. It's really a tough one to go on. We're going to talk a lot about scams. We're going to talk about how to avoid the scam. We're going to talk about what the scam is, a bunch of types of scams. And we're not going to hit them all. We're just going to hit enough that we think will help you guys tonight. The scams that are out there, that what you want to do to avoid them, and how you can go ahead and get your defenses against them. What is a scam? A scam is a con artist that's hitting on you guys. He's basically calling you up, he's calling you on the phone, he's going on the internet, and then he's going to look for you. And he's going out fishing. You guys ever heard the thing fishing? That's what it is. These guys are out there fishing for you. They're trying to get you and they want to hook you up and they're going to take you. And once they got you, they're going to get you. They're going to nail you and all they want is your money. Scammer could be anybody. They're, you know, they're basically, like we said, they're con men. They show no mercy. Once they got your hook, guys, they're not going to let you go. They're just going to keep hooking on you and keep getting that money and money and more money from you. What motivates scammers? Could be anything. Could be gambling debt. You know, John, we were playing dice today. John, I don't know where John went. He lost about 12 bucks in dice today. So, and he's because he's so tense because he doesn't have the money. So all of a sudden he needs financial gain on that and that's exactly what happens. You might, you know, you stand to inherit money from others. You know, you guys have a lot of money. Your kids want that money. You know, you hopefully, like all of us, the six of us, we loved our parents. We didn't care. They raised us right. We knew exactly what to do. How scammers find you? They're going to find you any way they can. A lot of time is on the internet. They find you on that internet. They're looking for you guys. You're looking for that. Can they find you at a club? Sure, they can find you anywhere. They can come door to door looking for you. They can find you anywhere, anytime, at any place. So that's what they're looking for. Scammers and victims, that's exactly what these guys do though. They're out looking for you. One thing they really look for is what? Secrecy. And we're going to talk a lot about that. They'll tell you, oh, don't say anything. Don't call your kids. That's a red flag. As soon as they're saying it's secret, don't believe them. That's when they're really sucking you in because they, don't, they want you not to tell anybody. That's how they're going to get you because they want, oh, don't tell anybody about this. Oh, you won the lottery. Don't tell anybody about this. And they don't want anybody to know because they know they got you. They know that they're scamming you on that. And that's what you've got to be careful of. There's a variety of scams we're going to be talking about. These are the ones we're going to hit today. We're going to hit about giveaway scams, we're imposter scams, charity, contractor, contractor scams, tax scams, and sweetheart. Johnny, why don't you tell me a little bit about giveaways? Hi, everybody. Okay, so once again, I've been banking a long time, 28 years, 23 years working security. I've seen every type of scam there is. I can tell you, just talking this year, 75% of my caseload this year with the bank is elder abuse. Crazy, by far the 
largest I've had in a long time. And elder abuse is not simple. It is a complicated situation for us. We're trying to protect you guys. We're trying to find out what's going on and we're trying to figure out these scams. And what my job here today is, is to educate you guys on what to do. So this envelope, everybody picked up one of these envelopes? Go ahead and open it right now. So in this side, this envelope, you're going to see, you're going to see two different letters. These are prototype letters that we have copied and sent out to you guys. These letters are lottery scam letters and a publisher's clearinghouse letter, right? That people actually get in the mail. Let's talk about the publisher's clearinghouse first. So somebody would get this publisher's clearinghouse and with this publisher's clearinghouse letter, they would get a check. And the check would say, hey, you won the publisher's clearinghouse, second place prize, $1 million enclosed, we have provided you a check. The check is not drawn off Publishers Clearinghouse. It's going to be drawn off somewhere, Atlanta, Georgia, Florida, something like that. It's going to be somewhere about $3,500. And they're going to tell you, hey, give us a call before you go to your bank. But what we're enclosing this check for is you have to pay some taxes before we can send you a million dollars. And everybody's like, oh, that's great. So then you guys come to the bank and you guys have a $3,500 check. If the bank does not put a hold on the check or say anything to you guys, the biggest misconception in banking is that people think the check's good. The bank didn't tell me it's bad. They should have told me it's bad. They should have put a hold on the check, right? But people don't understand the check has to go through a clearing process. The check's drawn off another bank. We have to send it to that bank. That bank gets it, and then they would send us the money. And a lot of times with you guys and the elderly, guess what? We trust you guys. You guys have been banking with us a long time, right? And we're like, hey, that's okay, right? But then what happens is you go ahead and you deposit that check. You get money. You decide to do a wire. You go to MoneyGram. You go to Western Union. Anytime you send out a wire, anytime you send a MoneyGram, anytime you send a Western Union, guess what? Guaranteed funds. Guaranteed funds, meaning... I can't call MoneyGram and say, give me back that money. I can't call Western Union and say, give me back that money. That money's gone. And then what happens is two days after you decide to send the money and you're all happy that you're going to get this million dollars back, guess what gets returned to the bank? That $3,500 check, which overdraws your account now. And you're like, well, how come the bank didn't stop it? Right? We do have processes in place, guys. I can tell you this. We, Mark and I go out and train branches in our departments all the time. What I love to preach at our branches and what we do is, can we put most elderly on a pattern? What do you guys think? Can we put you guys on a pattern of what you're going to do at the bank? The answer to that question, in my opinion, is yes. You guys live on Social Security and you live on pension. That should be what's going on at your guys' age. Right? And our Fremont Bank being 20 branches, soon to be 21 branches, we know all our clients. I would say 90 to 95% of the people that walk in our branches, we know by face and by name. Not only do we know them by face and by name, we know what you guys are going to do. So if you guys come into our bank and you guys want to deposit a Social Security check, perfect, no problem. But if you guys do something outside your pattern, you bring me a $3,500 check from Georgia, you tell me you want to send out a wire somewhere for $5,000 and it's not within your pattern, you know what we're going to do? We're going to ask questions. We're going to ask questions. And these questions aren't to get into your personal matters and stuff. These questions are for us to protect you guys. Because we know if we send out that money, it's not coming back. So we're going to ask you, are you sending it to a family member? Are you sending it to a friend? Have you ever sent somebody a wire before? Are you sure you want to send out this money, Graham? Where did you get this check? And if people are honest with us, am I going to stop this scam right here, this publisher's clearing us? Every single time. But when you guys don't tell us that something's going on sometimes and it sneaks through, it just irks, especially Mark and I. We go crazy, right? Because we want to protect you guys. Same things with the Mega Millions. It works the same exact way. They're telling you that you won Mega Millions. 
and you're going to collect this money, right? And they're going to enclose a check again. If any of you guys were to bring that up, I 100% guarantee you we will stop it. No doubt about it. And there's all, we're going to go over all kinds of scams. There's secret shopper scams, right? Where these people sign you up to be a secret shopper. Hey, guess what? We're going to send you a $2,000 check. Put this check in your account, and I want you to go to Target, Kmart, and Walmart, and I just want you to shop. $300 here, $300 here, and $300 there. And I'll tell you what, for your time, we're going to give you $200, but that $900 that's left over, Western Union that back to us. And if you do this, guess what? You're going to be a secret shopper for life. Now we know we can trust you. And these people are like, this is a great job. I love to shop, right? What happens? Check comes back, right? And these are things we need to watch out for. This is going on a daily basis. My folder last year, 2018. Guess how thick it is? This thick. I got a gigantic rubber band around it. Right? It happens all the time. Anytime people are telling me or I suspect something is going on, I always ask them, bring in the letter. What is going on? Let me talk to you. Right? And most of the time, guys, the only reason we're trying to talk to you is I'm not trying to cause heartache. I'm just trying to protect you. I'm just trying to protect you as well as our tellers, as well as our employees. Right? And there's sometimes, I can tell you recently, people are starting to get kind of angry. Right? And they're like, don't tell me what to do with my money. I can do whatever I... Yes, you can. You're absolutely right. But I can tell you what, I'm pretty sure this is a scam and I don't want you to lose money. Imposter scams. Go like Mark Rhodes house and come in and tell us a little bit about imposter scams. So I'm going to tell you a, a, a true story. This, this is something that actually happened to our family. That's my lovely wife over there, Marjorie. She came out uh, to be with us today. Uh, her father, my father-in-law, got a phone call one day from a kid who said he was my son. He called him up and said, hi, Grandpa, do you know who this is? And you know, Grandpa took a guess. He said, is this Trent? That's my son's name. And the kid said, yeah, yeah, this is Trent, for sure. Does this sound familiar to anybody yet? Have you guys heard about? Yeah, this is actually happening to a lot of people, a lot of people. So <clears throat> the kid said, hey, um, I'm in big trouble, Grandpa. I need help, right? I, I was in Southern California driving a car. I was speeding. I hit a pedestrian. I got arrested, and I'm in jail, right? And then uh, there's two people working this scam. Okay, this is an imposter scam. Uh, the, the second person is an adult. And the adult gets on the phone and says, I'm your, your grandson's lawyer. And here's what you need to do. You need to send money in order to bail him out of prison, right? So they told him to wire, wire some money. And this is a, this is a true story. Uh, he went down to the bank. Uh, Marjorie's dad went down to the bank, tried to get a wire. And like John was, was talking about, uh, the bank couldn't see immediately it was a scam. They, they wouldn't uh, honor that, right? So we went back to the, to the, you know, the people kept calling, the scammers kept calling, because that's what they do, they keep calling. And they said, okay, we'll go down to Target and buy some gift cards, $500 gift cards. You guys heard about this? Anytime we get into a discussion about buying gift cards, it's a scam, guaranteed. But he didn't know that. Right, he was worried for my son's safety. Right, so he uh, he went down and, and uh, bought a bunch of these five hundred dollar gift cards, scratched off the number, read it to the scammer over the phone. Now that the scammer had hooked him, okay, he kept calling back, and the story it got more intense because this is what they do. Right, they use threats and intimidation. So now. This supposed victim that my son, my son was 16 years old at the time. He lived with us in San Jose, right? No reason to believe this story. The pedestrian, this is what the, the scammer said, died. The pedestrian died and now he's got a murder charge. Again, uh, on the face of it, this whole thing seems completely absurd, but he ended up over the course of this scam sending $60,000, $60,000 to these people. Uh, and the only reason it stopped they say, you know, and by the way, they tell, they tell them, they threaten, don't call my parents. Okay, I'll, I'll be in, in bigger trouble. And the, the supposed lawyer says, don't call, don't let, don't let the parents know, right? Don't tell anybody about this. So he didn't. Finally, they stopped calling. I don't know why. Finally, they stopped calling. And after a couple months went by, finally, 
her dad called my son on his cell phone and said, hey, Trent, uh, how are you doing? Are you out of jail? Did that whole legal situation clear up? And my son, I was there with him at the time, he's getting this weird phone call. What are you talking about, Grandpa? I'm at home. I've been home all summer. So I got on the phone with him and, and found out the whole story. So, you know, this really happened. It really does happen. It's, it's terrible what these scammers do. They sink to, there's no level they won't sink to, right? And once that money's gone, right, after you find out it's a scam, it's too late. The money's gone. Right? There's nothing we could do to get that back, and you can't find them. These people are operating out of who knows where. They're calling on the phone. There's no way to find them. So um, what I would say to you today is, is keep that in mind. Tell that story. Right? The more people that hear that story, the more they're going to be skeptical when they pick up the phone if, the, if one of these scammers calls. If, if the word of mouth gets out there, I hope my hope is that they're going to be less successful with these scams. So watch out for those. See, the thing again, you know, $60,000, is that a lot of money to you guys? That's a lot of money. And you feel bad for his father-in-law who lost all that money. And again, but what was the key to the thing? What was the key to all that? Secrecy. Don't call. Don't do it. What do you guys should do? What, how do we solve that scam? Call. call. Pick up that phone and call Mark's wife. Okay, Dad, I, well, I mean, hey, daughter, what's happening? And tell her, is this true? So right there, just call. Don't, again, don't let them force you on secrecy. John, don't we, why don't you tell a little bit about uh, Safeway, too? Why don't you tell them that scam? Okay, so how, how many in here have bought gift cards before? How many have bought gift cards? Almost everybody, right? Bought gift cards before. One thing you got to be careful with gift cards is when you purchase a gift card and you go to Safeway and they activate the gift card and they give you the little receipt, right? That's perfect. So there's an example. This is a store credit card, but it's an example of sort of like a gift card. And on the back here, there's a little thing here that you need to scratch off to get the PIN number. Right here. Right? And in order to use this card, guess what? I need that PIN number. And the PIN number's blocked. One of the scams out there right now is you'll have crooks go into Safeway, and they'll take gift cards. A bunch. A hundred gift cards. They're no good unless they get activated. But what these crooks end up doing is they scratch off this code right here, right? And they take pictures of the gift cards and every single night they test out the gift card and they test out the gift card. It's not working. It's not working. And somebody will go into Safeway finally and decide, hey, you know what? I'm going to buy a $50 gift card for my grandson. And now you finally purchase that gift card. And guess who has the pin number on the back of the card because it's scratched off and you didn't notice that it's already scratched off the bad guy. And now when that card becomes activated, guess who gets to use that gift card? Okay, Bob, Maladon, why don't you tell us about a little bit about charity scams? I was the president of the union, and so we always had a fundraiser for our police athletic league pal. And uh, what we did is we signed a contract with phone solicitors to make phone calls for us. They were not police officers. They were actually um, hired people that were getting out of jail, giving them a job to start their new life, maybe help them out. And so they made the phone calls, and they were good phone calls, but as you know, at the same time, the scammers get out there, they see that we're out there doing phone solicitation, so they start making phone calls just on their own, and they start giving the same spiel, giving a different address where you can mail the check, which many people did. They thought it was going to PAL, but it wasn't, it ended up going to the scammers. There's ways around that, and that is this. You always gather the information. The phone number that they have will not be the police department. It's always a, a building over on Hagenberger Road, and that's where their office is. They have about 20, 30 phones in there that they make phone calls off of. So you get the information, but you don't know who you're talking to. You have no idea if it's a good call. All you do is get that information, hang up, and if you decide on donating, be it five, 10, 15, 20 dollars, whatever they're asking, all you have to do is get the phone number for the police department. Don't take the number that they give you, get on the phone, call 411 and get the phone on the police department. Do not call 911, that's not a good number, to get the information. Some people do that, believe it or not. <laughs> but all you have to do is, or Siri, you can get on the phone, just Google Oakland Police Department, your phone number is gonna pop up. It's gonna pop up there, you can call them. Everybody knows during that time that we are having a phone solicitation and the phone calls are going to start. And everybody knows what to tell them. And if you wanna donate, please donate. And that's how we handle those. Don't ever, ever give your money 
to the first phone call you get from a solicitor on the phone. You don't know who that is. You don't know who it is. It's impossible to know. But if you really like the, the money, where the money is going to go, the charity, great. Gather the information, take a breath, take your time, get on the phone, get on Google. You'll see something in a minute and you'll understand and you can get the phone numbers, find out if it's a good charity and if you'd like to donate, donate. But I can tell you now, I'm, I'm 64. Mark called everybody in here old. I think he said that, honestly. But that's how Haywood is. They don't feel like nice to people most of the time. <laughs> but I look at it as everybody is pretty good in here. 64, I'm 64, people 65, 70. I know somebody's in here 92, and if I had him stand up, you would not believe he's 92. He looks about 75. But everybody's still making their own decisions in here. That's why you're here, to learn about how to make sure you don't end up with us talking about you one day. And that's what we want you to learn today. And you'll see a couple more of these in a minute. Thank you, Mark. So charity scams, like Bob says, don't give out your phone number to them. You give your phone number, I mean, your uh, credit card number to them. You give out that credit card number, they're gonna start using. Like Bob says, to stop that one, call them. Call the charity that you guys like. Bob, why don't you talk about contractor scams a little bit for me. You know, I'm a contractor and I just happen to see a corner of your roof right here and you have a little hole in the wall. And you don't ever remember seeing that. And it, possibly this guy actually did that to the house while he came up to your door and he wants to do the work on your house. We're getting this now. Now, do you hire that guy? No, you just saw the work. What should you do? Hey, no problem. How much is it going to cost? Well, you know, he has like, $500. Okay, $500 sounds pretty good. You have a phone number? Get his phone number. Get his name. Get it all. Shut the door. I don't know if you want to call the police or not, but you can next day call a couple contractors. And now you're going to have to fix it anyway, whoever did it, obviously. Get a couple more contractors, get a couple bids. Don't get ripped off. Don't get ripped off. Also, don't take the lowest bid. The lowest bid is sometimes not the best price because that person's going to get into the job. He's going to get it halfway done. He says, oh, by the way, look what I found. And he's going to raise it all up for you. So the easiest way to do this is one, Find out the bids, three, four bids, whatever you want. Call a brother, call a sister who has had construction done in, in the past couple weeks, couple months, couple years. Better Business Bureau. See if you actually have a license. Make sure he has a license, a contractor license. You've got to have that. So make sure you cover yourself during these things that these people do, to, do all the time. Make sure you don't give people money for absolutely no reason. Just take your time, take a breath, and gather the information, and then make the best decision that you can. That's the best you can do. Mark? So like Bob's saying on that one, to stop a contractor scam, get a couple bids. Again, they're trying to get the urgency. Oh, you got to fix this right away. Oh, it's going to cost you a lot more. Don't listen to them. Don't listen to the urgency on that one. The next scam we have is a tax scam, John. Uh, so tax scams. So everybody knows taxes due by April 15th, right? What is the only possible way the IRS can contact you? Mail, <laughs> right? Certified sure. mail. Certified mail from the IRS. They cannot call you. They cannot email you. They cannot text you. But one of the biggest scams around that people are falling for and seeing a lot is they're getting these emails, they're getting these letters, they're getting these phone calls stating that they owe money to the IRS and they're going to put them in jail unless you pay this money back within 24 hours. Have you heard about this? Right? Yes. And, and, and people, people are panicking. They're going to buy gift cards, they're sending money, and doing all that. And people don't understand that the only way they can contact you is through certified mail. And even if I got a certified mail letter from the IRS, guess what? I probably still wouldn't call the number on that mail. I'd probably still look up the Internal Revenue Service and call them and explain to them what I just received to ensure everything was okay. We also know phone calls with area code 202. Why is area code 202 so important? Does anybody know? Washington, D.C., right, to make it seem like it's official. One thing that's going on with scams, too, is the, how many people have caller ID on their telephones, right? And you have them on your cell phones, right? Caller ID drives me crazy. It is super, super easy to change who is calling you. For instance, I got spoof call on my telephone. It's an app, a little app there. And what it allows me to do is it allows the, me to disguise who I am. So for instance, Mark, you have your phone on you? Right here. I'm going to call Mark. And I'm going to put that I'm somebody else. 
and Mark will go around and show you what shows up. Here it comes, right through my spoof call. What does that say, Mark? Yeah, that's the internal revenue service. Internal revenue service. I'm calling right from my cell phone using spoof card, right? That's how easy it is. And guess what? That gives you a false sense of, oh my God, it's really them. It came up on my caller ID. What did that take me? 10 seconds? Yeah. Right? And that's, it's called spoof card. Spoof card is free. It's a free service. Um, anybody can use it. That's what scammers use all the time. And it's perfectly legal. There's no law against doing that. There's law against fraud, but there's no law against actually spoofing your phone number. They could pick any number they want and they could pick any caller ID they want. Can they put down Fremont Bank? Sure. Yep. We get one. I, you know, I've been getting a lot of calls from a, a portfolio recovery. Anybody get this? It's a, supposedly some kind of debt collector. I get those at home all the time. I don't pick it up though. There's no need to pick it up, right? Worst case, they leave a voicemail. You can listen to it and decide, right? But our call center, our call center gets calls from customers that have been receiving a call from Fremont Bank. It says on their caller ID, Fremont Bank, it's not us. It's not us. So what's happening is our call center is telling them, oh, I'm glad you called, that's not us. We did not call you on that. So we have to watch out for the tax scams. Now you guys all know there's a lot of programs out there. Who has a cell phone? Have we ever talked to no Siri? Who's Siri? Siri's on my cell phone. I talk to Siri all the time. Hi, Siri. How are you doing? Hey, Siri. How are you doing? I'm pretty good. <laughs> hey, Siri. What's the weather out in Fremont? It's currently cloudy and 53 degrees in Fremont. Temperatures will be fairly consistent, averaging about 53 degrees. She goes on and on. Everything is listening to us right now. My son, Jacob, came to my house, came to my office today. Jacob works for Fremont Bank. Comes into my office, talks about it. He says, well, Dad, what would you guys do? Yes, I say, oh, we went out, Mom and I went out to Lazy Dog last night. Jacob's listening. He has his phone on him. These millennials carry their phones everywhere they go. He says, yeah, we went to Lazy Dog. And that's why I said we had a great time, great meal and everything. He walks out of my office. I start typing. He comes right back in. Dad, look at this, an ad for Lazy Dog. They're listening to us. Everything we say, guys, they're listening to us. So you got to be careful on that. But that's the technology out there. They're saying this little computer here is more powerful than the computer we had to put a man on the moon in 1969. Amazing how much. But how about Amazon? Anybody heard of Amazon? Who sort of Amazon? few of us and that who what's her name Alexa so you talk to Alexa we have a little thing on here on Amazon we're gonna talk about sweetheart scams guys sweetheart scams are happening and you hate to say it they're out there sweetheart scams are happening they're gonna be calling you they're trying to go ahead and they're gonna they're hitting who people who are widows widowers divorcees that's the ones that are gonna hit they're trying to get on you somebody who's who you know is isolated, who's lost their wife or their husband after 50 years, and they're lonely out there. They're actually lonely. They're not really, they're gonna try to meet you, they're gonna try to make you fall in love with them over the phone. It's not real, you hate to say it. John and I actually had a case we worked about 20 years ago. All of a sudden we get a call from one of, my, one of the branches, it wasn't Fremont Bank, but one of the branches, they had just given out $100,000 in cash. You know, now John and I have changed everything, especially at Fremont Bank. We don't let $100,000 in cash go out of our doors without them calling security first. But this one here, about 20 years ago, $100,000 went out. All of a sudden then we called the branch and said, why did you guys call us? We looked into it. We looked into it. We looked at a whole bunch of checks. All these checks were good. And they were good checks, good signatures. This was about check fraud. We jump on a plane. We fly down to L.A., John and I from the Bay Area. We fly, fly down. We contact this old guy, World War II vet, great guy. Um, start talking to him, said, do you know who this lady is? Oh, yeah. How'd you meet her? Met her at a grocery store. You met her at a grocery store. Yeah, we met. She talked to me. She, I said, was she cute? Yeah, she was cute. She was very good looking. And I said, okay, 
Then what happened? Well, then about a week later, I met her at the grocery store again. And she was there again. She talked more and more to me. And the next thing you know, we started talking. She knew everything about me. She just really liked me a lot. I said, and then? Well, then she knocked on my door. She knocked on my door and says, oh, I can help you with some stuff. I can help you clean up. I can help you doing this. And she worked this guy, God, three or four months. And finally, as John's talking to him, I look over and what do I find? Unfortunately, a bottle of Viagra for a 92-year-old man. He's looking at that. I said, oh, Jesus. So I said, so who is this lady? She's my girlfriend. I said, she's your girlfriend, hon. Did you write her this check? Yeah, I did. I said, listen, guy, she's using you. She's not. I said, we've already contacted the police on her. And I had to tell this old guy, guy, I hate to say you, she's, not take, she's taking you for your money. So we got to remember, guys, they're going to be out there looking for you. You got to be careful. We don't want to just, you know, meet somebody like my dad. You say, oh, he's in love with love. You know, you want somebody to talk to. Do you really think, you know, look at this young woman. Do you think many of us have a chance of getting her? Do you really think I'm, you know, Bob Valadon has a chance? <laughs> Maybe Bob. John, Mark Rhodes Owsley, does anybody have a chance with this girl? No, they don't. You know, they don't have a chance. In fact, this is what they look like right now. <laughs> there's Bob. No, that's Bob. There's Mark Rhodes Owsley, and there's John. They don't have a chance with this girl, guys. Guys, Mark, you might need a bro right now. You gotta watch that. But now, guys, so you don't have a chance. And ladies, same thing. You saw my mom. My mom was gorgeous. She was gorgeous. You know, we got a little bit old now. We can still wear a bathing suit. But do you really think this guy wants her? He's not. He's, in fact, that was me when I was on the SWAT team. <laughs> what? Nobody believes me? No. Come on. That's what I looked like when I was on the SWAT team. But guys, on sweetheart scans, it's tough, and we get a lot of it. So you got to be very careful with that and everything else. Bob, why don't you go ahead and talk about financial caregiving. These are our ideas on what you should be looking for when, when you plan on getting a financial caregiver. Now, it's going to be up to you when that happens, obviously. Like everybody in here today, I think everybody in here that I know of can make their own decision today on if you're going to need a financial caregiver. Every day you do something. You have breakfast, you have lunch, you have dinner, you read the paper, you pay a bill. Whatever you do during that day, while you still have the mindset and you still can make your own decisions, you can make a list today on what this person might have to do for you whenever it happens or if it ever happens. Some people it doesn't. But these are some ideas on what you can put on your list. And just get ready. It's OK. Get ready. You can do that. I'm a little crazy about it. I already have a living trust. I already have a little box where my ashes are going to go. I already have a list of things my kids got to call. My wife and I did this years ago, just so they don't have to deal with it. So you can make all those decisions today on what you want done when the day comes. And the day's coming for everybody, just a matter of when. So be it paying bills or be it um, any financial matter or paying your taxes or insurance. I don't know if everybody still writes a lot of checks. I know John doesn't write any checks. Well, he doesn't have any money most of the time, but he, he doesn't write many checks. I don't write any checks at all. Most of mine just comes right out of the checkbook, pay the bills, whatever it does, automatic PG&E. But if you have to write the checks, you got PG&E, you have your water bills, you have all that, and those should be on your list on what this person is going to have to do for you. Who is a good choice? Who that you're going to pick? How are you going to pick that person? How are you going to pick the person that's going to take care of you when you're going to be in need to be taken care of? And of course, we can put a lot of things up here. Of course, you're going to have to trust him or her. But at the same time, it's, it might be your sister. It might be your brother. It could be your kids. You don't know. But what you do know about your kids especially if you're 65 and older. You know what your kids have, kids have done in the past. I know, the, I know the trouble my two boys have been in, without a doubt. And I know which one should be handling my stuff, neither one of them. I'm going to have my brother-in-law do it. It's easier that way. He's a financial guy. Why am I going to have my two sons do it? So I'll take the uh, pressure off of them. They're taken care of in the, in the living trust. You can do those types of things. One person in charge, but the person in charge tells everybody what's in the trust, 
uh, when it happens that, that, that uh, they get what they get. Um, they manage your own finances. Uh, you can even have an even bank. And that's why when you go into a branch, you're buzzed in. You don't just walk in, you're buzzed in. They see who's coming in the branch. Nobody just walks in. And when you walk in, and you walk in with me, when Mark has been with you for the last five years, they're going to ask questions. Because they've never seen Bob. And that's just one of the little things that you have to have going during the time that you're still here doing your own thing. Bring, bring somebody with you to the bank. Don't just go by yourself. You can bring them now, it's fine. If that's the person that you're going to bring down the road and that's the person you're going to pick to take care of all your finances. But you have to have knowledge of the person. You have, if the person has lost his car because he hasn't made his payments, lost his house, went into debt, lost that, you definitely don't want that person being a financial manager. You could, if you trust a couple of your kids, you can sit down with them, talk to them about who you want. Talk, talk to them about who you should be looking at. They know the whole family and they know your friends. I know all my, my parents' friends if I was going to pick somebody to help them out. And it's very easy to do. You just have to make sure. And when you finally make that decision, that is your decision. You live by the decision and that's it. And it should work out because once you hire that person, you can actually have them in your house while you're still okay and have them take a little of this and say pay a couple bills here or uh, go down the store for whatever he's going to do. Go to the bank as long as the bank knows them. And then six months goes and he's doing a pretty good job. Okay, let me open this up a little more and have him do more. And until you get that trust in him, get that trust in him, then you can make him that your person. And if it doesn't work out, you start all over and do the same thing over and over again and try to find the person that's going to work with you and you'll feel very comfortable with that person. These are, the, these are some of the ideas we had of, of your poor choice. Obviously, I covered a couple of them. If, they have, if they're serious health problems, uh, just different relationships, you have to hire care, health care givers if you get really bad. There's just a lot of issues that could be up here on your poor choice. That's up to you on what choices that you make. And a poor choice can a poor choice can be really anything, just a matter of if you make that right decision in the long run after gathering all of this information, all of this information. So I think that's the, mostly what I wanted to cover. I'm going to talk to you about power of attorney. Now, cybersecurity is my gig. I'm a cyber guy. So why am I talking to you about power of attorney? It's because I have another cautionary tale about my wife's father. And by the way, we've been married 33 years. So I'm smart enough to have checked with her before I talk about this, okay? <clears throat> before he passed away at the age of 90 last year, he refused to give power of attorney to anybody, okay? And this is why power of attorney, I'm sure you're familiar with what it is, right? Giving somebody, somebody the uh, ability to access your accounts. Since he didn't do that, when he became ill and he had to go into long-term care and he uh, developed dementia, we had to pay for those costs out of our pocket. We had no way to pay for them, and he wasn't capable of paying those himself at that time. So it's best to take care of these matters you know, while you still have all your faculties, right? And you're able to make these decisions, okay? And likewise, living trust, how many people here have a living trust? Probably almost all of us, right? <clears throat> it's a good idea, everybody should have one. What's that story? Mark, Mark tells a story about if you don't have a trust, you're carving up, how does that go? You're carving it up four ways, right? Yeah, exactly. What's happening is, Bob, do you have a living trust? I do. John, you got a living trust? Yes. Mark, you got a living trust? Yes. Mike Wallace, you got a living trust? Yeah. I don't. I know. <laughs> I'm one of those guys who procrastinates. I'll get it done. I will get it done. But I, of course, I'm the youngest, maybe. Uh, maybe not. But. But I will get it done one of these days, but I got to do it. My son came in the, into my office two days ago and says, hey, Dad, I guess you're going to divide up your uh, fortune that you've made in four ways. I said, what do you mean? I got three kids, Jacob. What are you talking about? Well, you're going to give a, third, a fourth to Lacey. You're going to give a fourth to Buck. You give a fourth to me. And you're going to give a fourth to the government because you haven't done your living trust. I know it. I'll get my living trust done. I promise. All right. So I'm going to talk to you about identity theft. Identity theft, I'm sure you've all heard of it, but what is it? It's, it's, it's a scammer that's using your personal information to, uh, to masquerade as you, right? The, actually, the largest growing crime in the world right now, okay? Identity theft. So what they do, they either get access to your 
existing accounts or bank accounts or credit cards and so forth. And they do this using these numbers that identify you. You guys know the most common one, right? Social security number. Yeah, once they get a hold of that, they can get in and say they're you, right? Or they may open up new lines of credit, right, under your identity. Does that happen to anybody? It happens to a lot of people, okay? Yeah. So I'm going to tell you how to, how to uh, prevent that. So first of all, if they're getting access to your existing accounts, you're getting statements from these accounts, right? Your bank account, your credit card statements. So if you review those statements and you see anything on there that you didn't make that purchase or you didn't make that charge, okay, or you didn't debit your account, you don't recognize that charge, you are not liable for that if it's fraud, okay? You get your money back, you get a refund, right? That money is credited back to you if it's determined to be fraud. But the caveat is you got 60 days to report it. So you need to check your statements pretty much every month if you're gonna catch this when it happens, okay? Now, the other thing that we actually are seeing quite a bit of is mail theft, postal mail theft. So a guy I worked with just last week, he had a credit card bill come to his house. It wasn't a credit card that he signed up for. Um, he was also missing his W-2 that he was expecting from the company for his taxes. So what happened there? There was actually, they caught the guy. There was a guy, he was out on parole, he went around the mailboxes. And, and, and took the documents that he could find in the mailboxes, and one of those was this W-2 form of the guy I know. He took the W-2 and used that to sign up for credit card. So mail theft, you gotta watch that. Okay, so now you can also, you're probably aware you're allowed to check your credit for free, right, your own credit. You're, you're allowed one free credit report every year. There are three credit bureaus that you can get a credit report from free annually, so that means you can actually check your credit for free once every four months if you want to do that, spread them out, okay? But there's only one place that's legitimate that you can go to get your free credit report, okay? It's not freecreditreport.com, that's a fake. It's annualcreditreport.com, that's the one that's set up, the official site that's set up by the credit bureaus. If you ever see any of these things that come in the mail or they advertise to you on the internet, check your credit, and maybe pay $25, $30 to get your credit report. All they're doing is getting your free credit report and giving it to you for 25 bucks, right? So you're entitled to that for free. The other thing that I told you about this, this credit card that my colleague, this credit card bill that he got, you know, maybe you've heard of a uh, fraud alert. You could put that on your credit. Maybe you've heard of LifeLock. The thing about those services is that they don't stop the fraud, right? They just tell you that the fraud has happened. There is one thing you can do to actually prevent fraud on your credit, and that's to freeze your credit. And that's the handout that many of you have noticed that I left out for you over there with instructions on how to do that. So I froze my credit. It takes a leap of faith, right? Because now your credit's locked. You can't get new credit. If you want to go buy a car, you want to buy, buy a new house, whatever you might want to buy, get a new credit card, you have to unfreeze it. Okay, and, you, and you tell them, there's a website, or you can call on the phone and tell them how long you want it to be unfrozen so you could buy something, and then it freezes again. When you freeze your credit, no new lines of credit can be opened up under your identity. It's really your best protection. That's also free, by the way, because there, you heard about the Equifax breach. There's a big uproar after that. The government mandated that they have to, get, they have to allow us to do this for free. It's free to freeze your credit. It's free to unfreeze your credit. Unlimited. You can unfreeze it every other day if you want. Okay? I have a mailbox that I have to use a key to open and get the mail, but the mailman could put the mail in it and even packages. I mean, if I get um, you know, pharmaceuticals in the mail or small packages, whatever, they can still put it in there, but nobody else can get it out. Locking mailbox. And John tells us, don't put the red flag up. Yeah. I could talk about identity theft all day long. Locking mailbox, why is it good? Biggest compromise, to be a victim of identity theft is through the U.S. mail, right? I tell people I live on a court in Pacifica, 18 houses on my court, two houses on my court have those beautiful wooden mailboxes that look super pretty, right? Our mailman, like clockwork, comes at 2.30 every day, right? Everybody on our court works, except for the couple across the street from me. They're 80 years old, right? How long does it take for somebody to take a walk along my court and open up a mailbox and shut it? Not too long, about a second. How about if they get your bank statement? How about if they get your 401k statement? How about if they get your credit card statement? 
How about if they get a pre-approved credit card application and take it out of your mailbox? It's that easy, right? My mailbox is on my house. I don't even have a basket. It goes right to my floor. You got to break into my house to steal my mail. You know, and that to me, I feel safe with that. There's a ton of unlocked mailboxes though. Right? And when I tell people, if you have the ability to get a locked mailbox, the reason it's so good is these fraudsters aren't going to go and worry about prying open a locked mailbox when there's so many unopened mail, unlocked mailboxes. Right? And once again, it's you're not giving the mailman a key so he has to open your box. Right? It has a slit in it there. It's pretty big. Probably fits small pill bottles and stuff in there. Right? And envelopes. Yeah, there's some pretty good size ones. But what is that? An extra sense of protection. When you come home, you take the key, you open up the mailbox. Number two, another big thing, dumpster divers, right? So now, I don't know about everybody here, but in Pacifica, we have three garbage cans. We got a gray one, we got a blue one, we got a green one, right? So now we're super nice to these fraudsters, right? Because now I separate the garbage from the recycle from the green waste, right? And so when I get all this junk mail, one thing we've purchased and hope everybody has them is we have a shredder. They're not very expensive anymore. We don't just rip up mail. In my house, it runs through a shedder and we dump it right into the blue bin, right? And like clockwork, I play basketball Monday nights and when I come home, everybody's garbage cans lined up along the court, right? Not mine, right? When I leave for work that morning, I pull out my garbage cans and I know that the garbage man's gonna come about an hour after I leave from work. I don't have to worry, is that a raccoon going through my garbage can at night or is that somebody else? because everybody has bad days and sometimes we probably forget to shred. And I guarantee you the couple across the street that's 80 years old aren't shredding their stuff. And it's not too hard to rip something in half and put it together for dumpster divers. Right? Those are things you guys need to know. Your social security numbers, lock them up. Keep them in a safe deposit box. Keep them in a safe at home. The difference between small time identity theft and big time identity theft is a social security number. If they get that and your driver's license number, now I can apply for loans. It gets big time when it's that. That's a really, really important, that nine digit number is super, super important, right? So if you guys don't have that locked up, please lock it up. If you can't remember that number, I always tell people, go ahead and write it on a piece of paper, but don't write three numbers dash two numbers dash four. Put a couple zeros in front, forget the dashes, a couple numbers at the end, and you know the nine digit number in the middle is your social security number, right? If you can't remember it, but it's really, really important these days, guys, between identity theft and elder abuse, that's probably 90% of our case log now that Mark and I work as far as fraud goes at the bank, right? And it's really, because when people are pretending they're you and that's identity theft, they're a ghost till we catch them, okay? Thank you. Okay, yeah, we're almost done. Online risks, I would just say to you this, that if, if you get an email that you weren't expecting, just delete it, right? I mean, it's probably a scam, it's probably a bad link. What if it comes from someone you know? You ever get an email that just has a link and nothing else? Okay, or maybe it says, check this out, exclamation point, and a link, right? Guarantee you that's a virus. Now, if it comes from somebody you know, if it comes from your friend, their email's probably been hacked. And that's what hackers do. They go through all the contacts and they send out emails to everybody in the contacts with a bad link. So watch out for that. And that's all I'm gonna say about that. Okay? So He's out there. I knew we threw a lot at you. Just remember, it's, if it's too good to be true, it's not true. Those lotteries, like John talked about the lotteries. Those guys send out probably 400,000 of those all the time and if they hit 10 percent on them just imagine how much money at them so what are we going to do with the lottery when you get a lottery letter what are you going to do throw it away rip it up throw it away you, publishing clearinghouse contractor what are we going to do if a contractor knocks on your door don't open it, don't open it. that's a good idea but get the information from you get his car let him go what are you going to do on a sweetheart scam meet somebody the old-fashioned way but Valadon's been married almost 40 years now, met his wife at, the, at high school. I've been married 37 years. I met my wife through my best friend, one of my good friends. John, I don't know how you met your wife, but... Yeah. At the bank. Uh, oh, that's right. That's right. They were tellers together. They were tellers together. Mark, how'd you meet your lovely wife? College. College. Do it the old-fashioned way. Have somebody introduce you. Don't go on the internet. I know it's easy, that tender and all that other stuff. 
Be careful on that. Imposter scams, again, what they want you to do is secure. They want you everything secret. Don't do that. Just make sure you use your common sense. You guys are all smart in here.